Thank you all for braving the cold and being here tonight. I thought first I would talk a little bit about how this show came to be. And we have to thank Michael Hall, the amazing executive and artistic director here at the who is a dear friend for many, many moons, who asked if I might be interested in taking on the first ever LGBTQIA plus exhibition here at the Art Students League. And of course, I said, happily, I will do so. And where do you even begin trying to trace the gay and queer lineage of this place? Certainly one of the most historic cultural institutions here in New York City. So how do you actually start to uncover a, a gay past? And that was really fun and quite exciting. And I had a couple of markers and cues, places from which to begin. I knew, for example, that Deborah Cass, who opens the show here with her amazing self-portrait, a model, of course, after Andy Warhol's Liz painting, <coughs> where Deb then starts herself as Liz, um, infusing Warhol's work with a feminist iconography with the Jewish iconography and many other queer underpinnings. I knew that she was a regular here at the Art Students League when she was just a teenager. She lived out in the suburbs of Long Island and coming into the city was her lifeline. She went to MoMA, she went to Broadway shows, and she also enrolled in classes here at the Art Students League. And that is what paved the way for her to become a really successful and prominent artist who we still celebrate today. So I started to look at who I knew had gone here to the League. For example, Neil Lane, which is the small work on this wall, right here. I'm sure many of you know Neil from his jewelry design work. Neil is one of the most prominent jewelry designers in America. If you happen to watch The Bachelor, you have seen him deliver those diamond rings um, for the final segments of the shows. But Neil is primarily an artist, and he also studied here at the League back in the late 60s into the early 70s, and has always practiced as an artist. I happened to meet him out in LA many years ago and did a studio visit with him and was blown away by the work that he was doing and wanted to just start to collect these various voices from a number of periods and a number of places to start to tell a story. And when I started to first peel those layers of the onion away, I then started to need um, to be a little bit creative in how I would unravel and find even more artists. And I did all sorts of fun things. I did an open call on my Instagram account, which resulted in some hints of several people, many artists actually who are here in the room, and I will call all of you out um, as we move. For example, Naruki is here, Naruki Kikuta, who did this phenomenal painting. And Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he waved and everything. So um, you can see he not only has put his name here, but he has also put in Japanese katakana yeah, the name of the um, adult film star, Sean Ford, which is Sean Ford in Japanese. And I found out about Naruki through a friend who said, oh, you should really look at Naruki a curator colleague of mine um, who happens to work at the Leslie Lowman Museum of Art downtown, and they have one of Naruki's works in the collection. And I had never heard of Naruki, strangely, but when I went to his website and started to see his work, I said, absolutely, he needs to be in the show. And this was really, really fun to start to make connections, to get advice, to get some hints about where I might look to find people. Um, I also, of course, wanted to include as many different identities from our community, the LGBTQIA plus community, as humanly possible to make sure that as many identities as possible were represented in this exhibition. 
And I also realized very quickly that this would only be a starting off point, that we would hope to have 30 to 35 artists in the exhibition, and that it would just be the first chapter in what we hope will be a, a much longer book, so that in the future the League will be able to do many exhibitions highlighting artists from our community. And um, of course, there were many artists that I wanted to include in the show, but through various issues, either with them having absolutely no estate, no heirs, I could find a reference to the artist having studied here, but to actually find a work of art became very, very difficult. Um, I actually, at one stage, started to look at obituaries from um, artists who had lived, worked, and practiced at West Beth over um, near the West Side Highway, because I, of course, knew and know that that is a hotbed of artist activity here in the city, and I figured many people that live there probably studied here at the League. So, of course, as with any exhibition, there will be dead ends, but we have compiled a list of those artists so that, again, down the road in the future, hopefully they can be included in future iterations of this exhibition. Um, I also am very happy to be standing in front of a work by David Markai, who happens to be here. Would you like to wave? Thank you for coming. And uh, David is such an exceptional painter and such an exceptional human being. He is very intriguing in that he had, a, let's say, a very successful career in the world of advertising, not unlike someone that I happen to spend my career working on, Andy Warhol, who, of course, got his start in the world of advertising. And um, David has been painting for many years now, has studied here at the League, and um, lives in Connecticut and Vermont and a few other fun places. And I also wanted to think about the stories about what makes someone become an artist, want to become an artist. And David's story is probably one of the most intriguing I have ever heard in terms of what that thing, that catalyzing agent that pushes one over the edge into actually creating. Um, that I think I've ever seen. And David, is it okay if I tell the brief story? This has been published in many, many places, but David was actually out boat riding one day and had a bit of a wreck on the boat with a hitting a very big wave and he landed very heavily on the deck of the boat and had very severe trauma to the spine and to his head. And it happened to set off a creative um, explosion in his mind, if you will. And this is a verified condition that is very, very rare. But this accident opened the floodgates to your creativity, and you have certainly run with that. So I was so happy to pick this great painting in all of its wonderful abstraction. And that's also very important when you do a show like this, that you have to mix things up between the figurative and the abstract. And um, certainly when you are pulling together works from so many varied artists, 33 in this case, you have to start to get creative in terms of how you put it all together. And it was really quite fun when we had all the work here in the gallery lined up leaning against the walls. I just started to think about what conversations could happen here in the space. And we happen to have several works that have a nice pink commonality that leads you down the wall through pink, the representative clear colors. So how could you go wrong there? And then started to unfold a few other stories that we'll talk about as we move around. Um, I think of all of the discoveries that I made, finding out about artists that I hadn't heard of before, or had heard of, but only in a passing reference, one of the most intriguing stories for me is Harold Stevenson. And I knew Harold's name. Harold was a close friend of Andy Warhol. He appeared in a few of Warhol's films. He was in the same <coughs> social circles as Andy. He was incredibly prominent here in New York in the 1950s and the 60s. He studied here at the League, obviously. And 
For a variety of reasons, David's reputation started to slide, as will be a commonality for many of the artists in this exhibition. We can, of course, blame things like sexism and homophobia in so many ways for why many of the artists here aren't more widely known or more known um, in general as they should be. But Harold had his moment in the sun. And I'm sure many of you have gone up to the Jewish Museum to see the 1962 to 64 exhibition. Right now, Harold has a major work featured in that exhibition and also has a major painting in the collection of the Guggenheim Museum that is an epically huge nude male, um, some 35 feet long. It's absolutely massive. And uh, we were very lucky to find this work, which is from the mid-1980s. But Harold was sort of working in obscurity in many ways in the 1970s and the 80s. Um, in the early 2000s, he decided to leave New York. He was already well on in years. And he moved back home. And for him, home was very rural Oklahoma, about 45 minutes away from the Texas border. Here comes an artist recording as we speak. Hi. Wow. I like this. It's almost like a house. Yes. How are you? Welcome. Um, we'll talk about you and your work momentarily. But Harold um, really just moved back to his rural um, roots in Oklahoma and kept on painting, kept on working, took all of his works with him to Oklahoma and died sadly in obscurity. But um, when I was doing research for the show, I saw that he had studied here at the League, so I said I have to track down someone so that I can get a work. And I just happened to see a reference to him on Instagram, of all places, and a wonderful scholar who is um, in the realm of sociology met Harold, she teaches at a local university, a small, very small school there, and she befriended Harold, and they became very close. And he actually entrusted her, her name is Diane, with his legacy and with trying to resurrect his name and his work. And she has spent the past decade really organizing his archives, his files, the works that remain, working with his niece and his nephew, who are currently the stewards of all of that work, and trying to figure out how to get Harold's name back into the conversation. Because he deserves to be there. And I think we, we can all say that um, in the next few years, we're going to be hearing a lot more about Harold Stevenson. So I was very happy to be able to include him in the show. And these works, as we're on the topic of Harold, um, all of the works in the vitrines are also by Harold. And this was just one of the most miraculous, amazing discoveries, for me at least, putting the show together. And as you will see, they are all courtroom sketches. And when I found out more about this trial and what it stood for, and also that it had a very nice connection to the league as well. Um, it was really just mind blowing. So I'm sure many of you have heard of Charles James, who is one of the great American designers of all times in the realm of fashion. Well, it just so happens that Charles James also studied here at the league, as is so often the case. And certainly for any major artist from the early part of the 20th century into the mid part of the 20th century, that was almost a given, or certainly they passed through here in one way, shape, or form. But Charles um, was you know, very, very celebrated in his time, but also his career went downhill. He died nearly penniless. And there was a lawsuit that happened between Charles and a distributor of lower-priced fashion that he happened to have been commissioned by to create 30 new pieces of clothes. And it seems as though this mainstream brand had been ripping him off regardless. And when he realized that their designers were basically copying him, he said, I'm not going to make any more work for you. 
Um, so he did, I think, seven or eight designs and said, that's enough, you're already ripping me off. So they decided, of course, to go to court. They sued one another. Charles actually emerged victorious. But one of the main reasons he emerged victorious was that he called out his posse of supporters who were the wealthiest women in New York at the time and the most influential women in New York at the time. We have the editor of Vogue at the time. This woman was the um, single most famous radio um, talk show host of the era. This is all in the mid-1950s, keep in mind. Um, this is a member of the Whitney family. And the real discovery here, if you want to gather around, um, this would probably not be the person that you would immediately uh, think of as being a star witness for um, really much of anything, but this is Gypsy Rose Lee, who was the burlesque dancer of the age, and she was in her 40s at this time, and you can see her here from a variety of angles. Um, Harold was sitting in the courtroom sketching every day everything that happened throughout that trial, and Diane has all of these courtroom drawings. So it was actually really difficult to just choose a few because they were all so fantastic. This one I especially loved where you can see a garment actually has clearly been put into evidence that is draped over the judge's desk while people are discussing. But to see Gypsy Rose Lee here, she was one of Charles James's biggest clients, um, a complete fashion maven. And all of these women testified that there was no one better than Charles James, that he was the preeminent designer of his era, and that if anyone were to rip him off, they needed to pay him. And he actually won the case. Um, I love this quote. She says, Gypsy Rosalie, it's just a personal opinion. I don't like to pay $750 for a dress and find it around the corner for $35. Usually the case. Indeed. So these were just such a wonderful discovery, and Diane literally brought them, um, well, she shipped them to us here in New York um, in the portfolio that they had resided in, um, really for the past 20 years, untouched since Harold's death. So super great discovery. And, you know, I wanted to also infuse this exhibition with serious topics as well as fun topics. and try to reflect all of the different emotions that we as human beings play out and experience on a daily basis. So when I saw that Betty White painting, for example, um, which is done by a faculty member here, that I also want to be faculty who are teaching here to this day, um, Dominique Medici, I, of course, thought, A, she has to go on the show, B, Betty White, who recently passed is one of the great gay icons, hands down. And when I saw this picture of Betty with bunny ears, I was like, yes, that's definitely going into the show. And I hope later that you can look at many of these works in great detail. And certainly um, this painting, which is just absolutely phenomenal. Um, Doug Safranek, who is also faculty here at the League and is also here with us this evening. Thank you for coming, Doug. Uh, I was so blown away by the degree of um, detail that Doug is able to capture in his paintings. And originally I was thinking about a painting of a, a beach scene out at Coney Island, and Doug told me that it was the size of a postcard, so to say. And when I realized that that was your scale, and you were getting that level of detail, it was just, again, mind-blowing. But when I saw this picture of Coney Island and people having fun in the color, immediately thought about this image by Paul Cadmus, who is one of the most famous graduates of the program here, or attendee, I should say. And I, this is one of those pictures, um, being a big fan of Paul Cadmus, that just resides somewhere in the far reaches of my mind. So when I saw this picture, I said, we have to get a Cadmus Coney Island picture. 
So I called Bridget at the C. Moore Gallery, um, who, um, amongst many galleries, represents the estate of Paul Katniss, and said, do you happen to have a Coney Island? And she said, I just so happen to have a Coney Island. So it was very fun to be able to bring these two depictions of one of the most joyful places of our fine city together, um, spanning, of course, multiple decades apart from one another. So it was nice to be able to make that connection as well. Um, Emilio Sanchez is another um, student here, Blake. Um, Emilio was from a very prominent family in Cuba and made his way here to New York and to the League, of course, where he studied um, and um, was a very big fixture here at the League. And I think Emilio is, again, one of these artists that the world needs to know a lot more about. He's known for his architectural paintings, his really incredible use of light, the way that he plays with shadow, as you can see in this representative image, and also how it goes back in to space. It's called Three Doors, and I just love the perspective that draws you into what starts as a very bright and cheerful place, but starts to grow a little darker and perhaps more, I don't know if sinister is the right word, but at least darker as you, you peer in. And um, I wanted to, as soon as I saw these two sculptural works on either side, I knew that we had to pair the two together. Um, Pizarro and Salome are an aunt and niece artistic duo, both of them studied here at the League. I was very, very thrilled to be able to put these two works in, and the story behind them is just absolutely incredible. They are um, about the current crisis that's going on with migrant kids um, here in the States, with so many children coming from both Central and South America, trying to find better times and a better life here in the United States, and often, sadly, get separated from their caregivers um, in the very tenuous crossing of the border. So um, Patricia and Nancy decided to dedicate a new series of work to those kids and to literally paint a brighter future for them, um, surrounded by beautiful colors, flowers, and the idea of growth and reaching up for hopefully a much better uh, reality than what they're currently experiencing navigating the um, immigration system here in this country. So it was really fantastic to be able to include their work as well. And where is Coco? There you are. So Coco studied here at the League, hailing from France originally and came here to New York. And not only was a student here at the League, but I also, one of the things I love about your biography is that you um, posed many times for Alex Capps, um, one of the great American painters, and I hope you've all had a chance to go up to the Guggenheim to see his show. But when I saw this picture, the femme fatale, the bold woman smoking against this bright, colorful, cheery red background, I knew that was the picture that we had to put into the show. And I also love the conversation that it has with Deb Cass and her more Holly and pop imagery that way, whereas you're here in ways referencing Wittgenstein and the pop art movement, of course, but still making it completely in full of your own. So thank you for participating in the show. When I saw the painting in the middle um, by Gerald Simcoe, um, Gerald is very well known for his um, still life paintings. He does really great baskets of fruits and vegetables and is very technically adept. But as I was digging around his website, once I found him as a student here at the League, I landed on this picture and it was so regal and strong and queer in many ways that I really wanted to figure out what the backstory was. So when I asked him, I thought he was just mimicking an old master, inserting a friend or someone else into that narrative arc. Well, it's actually a self-portrait of Gerald, and the story behind it is quite funny. 
Um, it has nothing to do with an old master reference or trying to get um, something just so out of a Dutch painting, etc. It's actually a really fierce outfit that Gerald wore one night to Limelight, the club here in New York. And he was fairly new to New York. He decided to go like all out, dressed up, and went and stood on the queue. I'm sure a few people in this room were probably on that queue at one point in time. And because of this really phenomenal outfit, the doorman walking down the line said, you, in. And he got pulled in because of this really cool outfit. And he decided to memorialize that story very soon thereafter painting his self-portrait as a bit of a triumph of um, breaking the velvet rope um, in New York City, which is no <coughs> small feat. So this wall dedicated to people working in the fashion business. Uh, this is a really great Kenneth Paul Vlaw, um, who worked with Halston for a very long time, as did Joe Mueller, who was also a very good friend of Andrew Warhol's. Um, I tracked both of these down um, from the collection of Chris Royer, and Chris was one of the original Halstonettes and also worked as the fit model in Halston's um, atelier for many, many moons, and she has just an absolutely great collection of fashion illustration in general. Um, we did a, a Warhol at Halston exhibition when I was at the Warhol Museum and we borrowed many things from Chris, so I knew that she had these, and she was very happy to include them in the show. And then when I found out about Chuck Nitzberg, who is here um, with us, Chuck, where are you? Are you hiding somewhere? There you are. Thank you for being here as well this evening. Um, I just thought this wall would look really, really great together, and luckily it did. So Chuck, um, who still teaches here at the league, he actually has a class this evening starting at 7 o'clock. If anyone wants to run downstairs and enroll quickly, I think you probably can. But Chuck does lots of fashion illustration and has another body of work, which is, of course, implicitly tied to the idea of the body in fashion, where he depicts these really absolutely phenomenal um, male images that play on ideas of the BDSM community. Um, you can certainly link. Um, many aspects of this work to some of the great names of art history to be sure but they're so fun and bold and daring that um, it was a, a huge pleasure to be able to this work in the show and i just love this blue powerful face more than anything so thank you i was so happy to find andrew's where um, andrew actually works here at the league in addition to being a student here and he specializes in comic illustration and did this great five panel narrative about a gay love story. So I hope you'll take a moment to read that in detail. And Juan Pinas Josa, who is also here. Juan, there you go, straight across from me. I was so happy to find this work as well. And Juan is a great assemblage artist and studied here at the League as well. And what is more beautiful than so many great colorful elements, flowers, this great bird figure up at the top wrapped with the snake, of course, and you just create these incredible whimsical other worlds. So I was so happy to find you and this work, so thank you for participating in the show. And I am so happy that we were able to put your work next to Chitra, and I think they work really, really well together. Chitra Ganesh is um, a wonderful Indian American artist who lives here in the city and not unlike Deborah Cass was looking for a bit of a, an escape as a high school student here in the city and she too found herself here at the league enrolled as a teenager. She is now um, incredibly successful doing tons of exhibitions and I was really hoping to get a self-portrait from her, which are quite rare. And this, if you look at the title, is Portrait of an Artist is a Unicorn. And I was like, what is gayer than that? <laughs> so, of course, and that was an opener. So we, of course, had to put the work into the show. Um, by the way, I hope that you can all come and interact with these sculptures, which you can actually pick up. One of the rare times in the gallery space that you can actually pick up 
or uh, anyway, I interact with them, but Kerry Gleason um, has been a student on and off here at the League for 27 years, and she's only in her 40s. So she too started as a teenager, and most recently studied um, bronze and sculpture here at the League, and made these and also provided the, the molds and the casts that she worked with. So please do take a look at those. Quickly talking about this wall, um, I knew that Polytech has always had his history here at the League. There's Patricia and Nancy, who made the beautiful works with the two children with the flowers on the wall. Hi, hi. We already talked about the work, but everybody should see, so they know who you are. And um, at any rate, I'd always seen in Paul Tech's biographies that he too had studied here at the Lee, and um, I want to thank the entire team here at the gallery and at the Lee for helping in doing a little bit of research. Anki, I think you're here. Thank you for all of your help. And Zenia, thank you as well. Um, Stephanie, who is the archivist here at the Lee, um, was the first person we ran names by to actually guarantee that people had studied here. We didn't want any interlopers, of course. But Paul Tech was the one that we could find no actual record of. However, it's in all of his bio material. It's on the website of famous artists who have gone to the league. So I think one day, hopefully, a record will be found that he actually was here. But this work in particular, is he was of course known for many things, um, sculptures, paintings. Um, there was the great survey show at the Whitney several years ago that I hope many of you saw. But he also did lots of images looking out of his window in New York. And this work was made um, just a few months before he died of AIDS. And it is very somber and bleak. And you can see that it is somewhat um, on the depressing side. But um, I also wanted to capture that very precise moment in New York, knowing how horribly impacted the arts community was by AIDS um, throughout the course of the 1980s. So we were very happy to borrow this from the foundation, um, which Bob Wilson houses out at his center in, in Waterloo. Um, this work, which actually is not a work, but it is a, a hint and a reference to a work, I hope you've all had a chance to read this. I've always heard that um, Bob Rauschenberg, one of the great icons of 20th century art, had done a performative action here while studying at the League, and that he put a piece of meat paper down on the front steps of the League and allowed people to step over that paper and leave their footprints, and that he then picked that paper up and tacked it to the wall for one of his studio prints as a drawing, letting it be a really automatic drawing, if you will, in that the artist had no direct hand, but that it was made from the labor of people stepping over it. And we could only find one official account from it in a 1974 um, interview that Robert created with Bob. So, um, we approached the Rauschenberg Foundation to ask if they would allow us to recreate the work so that we could indeed, on the opening day of the show, put the paper down, let people tread over it, and then tack it to the wall. However, interestingly, Bob very clearly said in his final um, documents, if you will, he never wanted any of his performative actions to be recreated or reperformed. So um, we worked very closely with the Foundation. They provided this great statement, and we figured we'll just tack that statement onto the wall um, to make sure that people know that that action happened. Um, really great print of the Time New York by William Mencken, Bill Mencken, who is a very long time faculty member here at Lee, and also this phenomenal pajama photograph. And um, if you haven't heard about pajama, do some more research. It was a, a three person. Collective of uh, um, Paul Katniss and Jared French and Jared's wife, um, who Margaret French, and the three of them would take nude photographs of each other pretty much on a daily basis out of Fire Island and um, in Provincetown, the, the places where nudity um, 
was and it continues to be um, a very prevalent part of life. Ajmal studied um, down at the South for college, made his way to New York, and um, was working at, of all places, as you know, young um, folks do here in the city, at the Equinox over at Time Warner, two blocks away. He also happens, in addition to being an artist, um, now happens to be a bodybuilder and a fitness instructor, but he was then working at Equinox, and something went wrong, and he was fired from his gig at Equinox. So he was really sad, and he was just basically trolling in the streets, trying to figure out what to do next. And he was walking past the front door of the league, looked up, saw a few pictures in the window, came in, asked what this place was, and they directed him over to the registrar's office. And he enrolled for a class, and it changed his life. He, when he told all of us that story, it was just absolutely incredible to think that it was almost fate that brought him here. Um, in the years since, he's gone on to do his MFA at um, the Art Institute of Chicago, and he lives out in Chicago now. And because he works in fairly large-scale format, and because we had a fairly limited budget for the show, I thought, well, instead of lugging something all the way from Chicago, why don't we actually invite Ajmal to come to New York and create a new work just for this exhibition? And almost everything he does is a combination of works that he welds and creates um, in metal, but also a lot of found objects. So we were all pretty convinced that we would have something exceptional. Um, in the end to um, put into the show. And sure enough, Ajmal arrived and went down to the basement of welding studios, um, started looking for objects, put a few things together. He wanted fresh flowers to be um, a part of the installation. And you can also see those of you that spend a lot of time here at the league. If this table looks familiar, it's because it used to be in the cafe. <laughs> He found that and decided to incorporate that into the sculpture as well. And it's just so absolutely stunning. It almost looks as though a samurai warrior has like, collided with a flock of blackbirds um, that have crashed into it. And I think the most beautiful part of this work are the boots, which happen to be his grandmother's boots. And he's incredibly close to his grandmother. Um, she lives in Brooklyn, and when he came home to do this show, he's from New York originally, um, he of course stayed at grandma's house. And the day that he arrived, he told his grandmother that he was in an art exhibition at the Art Students League, and he wanted her to come. And that's when he realized that he'd never officially come out to his grandmother. And he realized that might be a good idea, and that this isn't a LGBTQIA plus themed exhibition. So sure enough, he, he built up the courage that night to tell her, and um, luckily she was completely fine with it and was so happy to be here for the exhibition. And I asked her if he um, sought out her permission to put her boots into the sculpture. She said, I had no idea he stole those out of the costume. <laughs> so, but it's his homage to his grandmother and how important she is to him and to his upbringing and his story, and he wanted to show that as a place where beauty grows up from something very bonded to her. So that was a really lovely moment. And let's talk about this absolute beauty by Judith Godwin. And um, Judith is just such a powerhouse of painting, and when I saw this image, it was actually very difficult to choose which painting to put into the show. But when I saw the title of this, Elegy to a Slain Deer, it was just, wow. Maybe it's because I'm from Western Pennsylvania where hunting is a very big thing, but um, I just love the violence and the power and the beauty that are all combined in this amazing painting. And um, Judith, you know, showed alongside all of the, the major artists and sadly because it, she was a woman and likely because she was a lesbian woman. Um, didn't get the same limelight that so many of her male peers um, happened to do. Um, I'm very thankful to Barry Campbell and the gallery. Both representatives are here. Thank you for coming tonight. And thank you for lending this really 
phenomenal picture, and they are um, very carefully taking care of Judith's legacy. Now Judith passed, what, uh, 21? So, yeah, uh, yeah uh, just a year and a half ago, but um, Judith, you know, came here to the league many times, and we were just so honored to be able to include her in the show with this incredibly powerful painting. We were really looking away to be able to get this great Cy Twombly work on paper um, from the collection of Beth Rudin Dewey, who's one of the great collectors of our modern age. And uh, Beth is a very dear friend, and I've learned over the years that if you're ever looking for anything, like she's a very good place to start. So I asked Beth what she had by uh, uh, Twombly, of course, had several options to choose from. But I really wanted to pick something early, so please take a close look at that work. And also this great work by Jared French, who was one of the three members of Pajama, who was also Paul Cadmus's lover, um, as were so many. Um, George took her over there included. But uh, again, was able to borrow this work from DC Moore Gallery, and it is just so phenomenal. Jared was very much into doing biomorphic images, and I just sense that this is like primal human creativity all fusing together in this totemic sculpture that ends in power, and it seems as though the globe is spinning between someone's outraged hands. George's work. <laughs> and also this really, really early great work by Sonia, Seko, that's from 1956. And Sonia also um, just led a very tortured life. She was completely out. She never hid her lesbian identity. She was a powerhouse. She was in the same shows as Jackson Pollock, you name it. She was in all of the big shows. She was very disgusted. Betty Parsons showed her work. Many of the great gallerists, um, Peggy Guggenheim, loved her work and collected it. And she sadly, she was from Switzerland, made her way here to the States where she lived for many moons, but um, moved back to Switzerland where sadly she committed suicide. And thus sadly went back into the, the closet of obscurity, if you will. But I think we'll also see a lot more coming from Sonia and um, Peter Blum Gallery was very generous in lending this piece um, for the exhibition. Please join me in thanking Eric Scheinman.